Adelstrop by Edward Thomas Read for LibriVox.org by Terence Nunn Yes, I remember Adelstrop, the name, because one afternoon of heat the express train drew up there unwontedly. It was late June. The steam hissed. Someone cleared his throat. No one left and no one came on the bare platform. What I saw was Adelstrop, only the name. And willows, willow herb and grass and meadow sweet and haycocks dry. No whit less still and lonely fair than the high cloudlets in the sky. And for that minute a blackbird sang close by. And round him, mistier, farther and farther, all the birds of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Annabel Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. Where for LibriVox.org by Pan Jung Chung. It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with the love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee, with a love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago, in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud, trilling my beautiful Annabel Lee, so that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes. That was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the crowd by night, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, or oh, many far wise than we, and neither the angels in heaven above, nor the demons down under the sea, can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And so, all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride. In the sepulchre, there by the sea, in her tomb, by the sounding sea. The end. This recording is in the public domain. Base Details by Siegfried Sassoon. Read for LibriVox.org by Terence Nunn. If I were fierce and bold and short of breath, I'd live with scarlet majors at the base and speed glum heroes up the line to death. You'd see me with my puffy, petulant face, guzzling and gulping in the best hotel, reading the roll of honour. Poor young chap, I'd say. I used to know his father well. Yes, we've lost heavily in this last scrap. And when the war is done and youth stone dead, I'd toddle safely home and die in bed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Canada. 
by Ella Wheeler Wilcox. Read for LibriVox.org by Jackie Nyman, June 2008, Pembroke, Ontario, Canada. Canada. England, father and mother in one, look on your stalwart son. Sturdy and strong, with the valor of youth, where is another so lusty? Coated and mailed with the armor of truth, where is another so trusty? Flesh of your flesh, and bone of your bone, he is yours alone. England, father and mother in one, see the wealth of your son. Forests primeval, and virginal sod, wheat fields golden and splendid, riches of nature and opulent God, for the use of his children intended. A courage that dares, and a hope that endures, and a soul all yours. England, father and mother in one, hear the cry of your son. Little cares he for the glories of earth, lying around and above him. Yearning is he for the rights of his birth, and the heart of his mother, to love him. Vast are your gifts to him, ample his store. Now, open your door. England, father and mother in one, heed the voice of your son. Proffer him place in your councils of state. Let him sit near and attend you. Ponder his words in the hour of debate. Strong is his arm to defend you. Flesh of your flesh and bone of your bone. Give him his own. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The following poem is read for LibriVox.org by Shona Brogdon Sturble. Corina's Going a Maying, Robert Herrick. Get up, get up for shame, the blooming morn upon her wings presents the god unshorn. See how. Aurora throws her fair, fresh-quilted colors through the air. Get up, sweet slug a bed, and see the dew bespangling herb and tree. Each flower has wept and bowed toward the east above an hour since. Yet you not dressed, nay, not so much as out of bed. When all the birds have mutton said, and sung their thankful hymns, tis sin, nay, profanation, to keep in, when as a thousand virgins on this day spring, sooner than the lark, to fetch in May. Rise and put on your foliage, and be seen to come forth, like the springtime, fresh and green, and sweet as flora. Take no care for jewels for your gown or hair. Fear not, the leaves will strew gems in abundance upon you. Besides, the childhood of the day has kept against you come some orient pearls unwept. Come and receive them while the light hangs on the dew locks of the night, and Titan on the eastern hill retires himself, or else stand still till you come forth. Wash, dress, be brief in praying. Few beads are best when once we go amain. Come, my Corina, come, and coming, mark how each field turns a street, each street a park made green and trimmed with trees. See how devotion gives each house a bough or branch, each porch, each door ere this an ark, a tabernacle is, made up of white thorn, neatly interwove. As if here were those cooler shades of love, can such delights be in the street and open fields, and we not see it? Come, wheel abroad, and let's obey the proclamation made for May, and sin no more, as we have done by staying. But my Corina, come, let's go a maying. There's not a budding boy or girl this day, but has got up and gone to bring in May. A deal of youth ere this is come back, and with white thorn laden home. Some have dispatched their cakes and cream before that we have left a dream, and some have wept and wooed and plighted troth, and chose their priest ere we can cast off sloth. Many a green gown has been given, many a kiss both odd and even, 
Many a glance, too, has been sent from out the eye, love's firmament. Many a jest told of the keys betraying this night, and locks picked, yet we're not amaying. Come, let us go while we are in our prime, and take the harmless folly of the time. We shall grow old apace, and die before we know our liberty. Our life is short, and our days run as fast away as does the sun, and as a vapor or a drop of rain once lost can ne'er be found again. So when or you or I are made a fable, song, or fleeting shade, all love, all liking, all delight lies drowned with us in endless night. Then while the time serves, and we are but decaying, Come, my Corina, come, let's go a maying. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fear No More by William Shakespeare. Read for LibriVox.org by Caitlin Cooper. Fear No More. Fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter's rages. Thou thy worldly task hast done, home art gone and tain thy wages. Golden lads and girls all must, as chimney sweepers, come to dust. Fear no more the frown of the great, thou art past the tyrant stroke. Care no more to clothe and eat, to thee the reed is as the oak. The scepter learning physic must all follow this and come to dust. Fear no more the lightning flash, nor the all dread thunderstone. Fear not slander, censure rash, thou hast finished joy and moan. All lovers young, all lovers must consign to thee and come to dust. No exerciser harm thee, nor no witchcraft charm thee. Ghost unlaid forbear thee, nothing ill come near thee, quiet consummation have, and renowned be thy grave. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Fifth Ode of Horace from Book One. Translated by John Milton. Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Dowling. Quis multa gracidis de puer in rosa, rendered almost word for word, without rhyme, according to the Latin measure, as near as the language will permit. What splendour youth, bedewed with liquid odours, courts thee on roses in some pleasant cave? Pyrrha, for whom bindst thou in wreaths thy golden hair, plain in thy neatness? Oh, how oft shall he on faith and changed gods complain, and seas rough with black winds and storms, unwanted shall admire, who now enjoys thee credulous, all gold, who always vacant, always amiable, hopes thee, of flattering gales unmindful. Hapless they, to whom thou untried seemst fair, me in my vowed picture the sacred wall, declares to have hung my dank and dropping weeds to the stern god of sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The following poem is read for LibriVox.org by Shona Brogdon Sturbel on May 27, 2008. Forget Not Yet, Sir Thomas Wyatt Forget not yet the tried intent of such a truth as I have meant, my great travail so gladly spent. Forget not yet. Forget not yet when first began the weary life, you know, since when the suit, the service, none tell can forget not yet. Forget not yet the great essays, the cruel wrong, the scornful ways, the painful patience in denays. Forget not yet. Forget not yet, forget not this, how long ago hath been and is 
the mind that never meant a miss, forget not yet. Forget not then thine own approved, the which so long hath thee so loved, whose steadfast faith yet never moved, forget not this. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Forgiven by Margaret E. Sangster. Read for LibriVox.org by Jackie Nyman. June 2008. Pembroke, Ontario, Canada. Forgiven. You left me when the weary weight of sorrow lay like a stone upon my bursting heart. It seemed as if no shimmering tomorrow could dry the tears that you had caused to start. You left me, never telling why you wandered, without a word, without a last caress. Left me with but the love that I had squandered, the husks of love, and a vast loneliness. And yet, if you came back with arms stretched toward me, came back tonight with carefree, smiling eyes, and said, My journeying has somehow bored me, and love, though broken, never, never dies. I would forget the wounded heart you gave me. I would forget the bruises on my soul. My old-time gods would rise again to save me. My dreams would grow supremely new and whole. What though youth lay a tattered garment o'er you? Warm words would leap upon my lips, long dumb. If you came back, with arms stretched out before you, and told me, dear, that you were glad to come. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. If you're anxious for to shine in the high aesthetic line, by William Schwenk Gilbert, read for LibriVox.org by Julie van Wallichem. Am I alone and unobserved? I am. Then let me own, I'm an aesthetic sham. This air severe is but a mere veneer. This cynic smile is but a wile of guile. This costume chaste is but good taste misplaced. Let me confess, a languid love for lilies does not blight me. Lank limbs and haggard cheeks do not delight me. I do not care for dirty greens by any means. I do not long for all one sees that's Japanese. I am not fond of uttering platitudes and stained glass attitudes. In short, my medievalism's affectation, born of a morbid love of admiration. You must get up all the germs of the transcendental terms and plant them everywhere. You must lie upon the daisies and discourse in novel phrases of your complicated state of mind. The meaning doesn't matter if it's only idle chatter of the transcendental kind. And everyone will say, as you walk your mystic way, if this young man expresses himself in terms too deep for me, why, what a very singularly deep young man this deep young man must be! Be eloquent in praise of the very dull old days which have long since passed away, and convince them, if you can, that the reign of good Queen Anne was culture's palmiest day. Of course you will pooh-pooh whatever's fresh and new, and declare it's crude and mean. For art stopped short in the cultivated court of the Empress Josephine. And every one will say, as you walk your mystic way, If that's not good enough for him, which is good enough for me, Why, 
what a very cultivated kind of youth this kind of youth must be then a sentimental passion of a vegetable fashion must excite your languid spleen an attachment a la plato for a bashful young potato or a not too french french bean though the philistines may jostle you will rank as an apostle in the highest static band if you walk down piccadilly with a poppy or a lily in your medieval hand and every one will say as you walk your flowery way if he's content with the fetch below which would certainly not suit me why what a most particularly pure young man this pure young man must be end of poem this recording is in the public domain It is not always May by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, read for LibriVox.org by Caitlin Cooper. It is not always May. No hay perjados en los nidos de antano, Spanish proverb. The sun is bright, the air is clear, the darting swallows soar and sing, and from the stately elms I hear the bluebird prophesying spring. So blue you winding river flows, It seems an outlet from the sky, Where waiting till the west wind blows, The freighted clouds at anchor lie. All things are new, the buds, the leaves, That gild the elm tree's nodding crest, And even the nests beneath the eaves. There are no birds in last year's nest. All things rejoice in youth and love, The fullness of their first delight, and learn from the soft heavens above the melting tenderness of night. Maiden that readest this simple rhyme, enjoy thy youth, it will not stay. Enjoy the fragrance of thy prime, for, oh, it is not always May. Enjoy the spring of love and youth, to some good angel leave the rest, for time will teach thee soon the truth, there are no birds in last year's nest. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode to the West Wind by Percy Bysshe Shelley Read for LibriVox.org O wild west wind, thou breath of autumn's being, thou from whose unseen presence the leaves dead are driven, like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing, yellow and black and pale and hectic red, pestilence-stricken multitudes. O oh, thou, who charitest to their dark wintry bed the winged seeds, where they lie cold and low, each like a corpse within its grave, until thine azure sister of the spring shall blow, the clarion o'er the dreaming earth, and fill, driving sweet buds like flocks to feed in air, with living hues and odors, plain and hill, wild spirit, which art moving everywhere, destroyer and preserver, here, oh here. Thou on whose stream, mid the steep sky's commotion, loose clouds, like earth's decaying leaves are shed, Shook from the tangled bows of heaven and ocean, Angels of rain and lightning, There are spread on the blue surface of thine airy surge, Like the bright hair uplifted from the head Of some fierce maenad, Even from the dim verge of the horizon to the zenith's height, The locks of the approaching storm. Thou dirge of the dying year, to which this closing night will be the dome of a vast sepulchre, vaulted with all thy congregated might of vapours, from whose solid atmosphere black rain and fire and hail will burst, O oh, hear! Thou who didst waken from his summer dreams, the blue Mediterranean where he lay, 
Lulled by the coil of his crystalline streams, Beside a pumous isle in Baye's bay, And saw, in sleep, old palaces and towers, Quivering within the waves in tenser day, All overgrown with azure moss and flowers, So sweet, the sense faints picturing them. Thou, for whose path the Atlantic's level powers Cleave themselves into chasms, while far below the sea blooms and the oozy woods which wear the sapless foliage of the ocean know thy voice and suddenly grow gray with fear and tremble and despoil themselves. Oh, hear! If I were a dead leaf, thou mightest bear. If I were a swift cloud to fly with thee, a wave to pant beneath thy power, and share the impulse of thy strength, only less free than thou, O oh, uncontrollable, if even I were as in my boyhood, could be the comrade of thy wanderings over heaven, as then, when to outstrip thy sky speed, scarce seemed a vision, I would ne'er have striven as thus with thee in prayer in my sore need. Oh, lift me as a wave, a leaf, a cloud. I fall upon the thorns of life. I bleed. A heavy weight of hours has chained and bowed, one too like thee, tameless and swift and proud. Make me thy lyre, even as the forest is. What if my leaves are falling like its own? The tumult of thy mighty harmonies will take from both a deep, audible tone, sweet though in sadness. Be thou, spirit fierce, my spirit. Be thou me, impetuous one. Drive my dead thoughts over the universe like withered leaves to quicken a new birth. And, by the incantation of this verse, scatter, as from an unextinguished hearth, ashes and sparks, my words among mankind. Be through my lips to unawakened earth the trumpet of a prophecy. O oh, wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? End of poem. This work is in the public domain. On His Blindness by John Milton Read for LibriVox.org by Leon Meyer When I consider how my light is spent Ere half my days in this dark world and wide And that one talent which is death to hide Lodged with me useless Though my soul more bent to serve therewith my maker And present my true account Lest he returning chide Doth God exact day-labor, light denied, I fondly ask? But patience, to prevent that murmur, soon replies, God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. Who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly. Thousands at his bidding speed and post o'er land and ocean without rest. They also serve him, who only stand and wait. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. People at Night by Rainer Maria Rilke Read for LibriVox.org People at Night The nights were not made for crowds, and they sever you from your neighbor, and you shall never seek him defiantly at night. 
But if you make your dark house light to look on strangers in your room, you must reflect on whom. False lights that on men's faces play distort them gruesomely. You look upon a disarray, a world that seems to reel and sway, a waving, glittering sea. On foreheads gleams a yellow shine where thoughts are chased away. Their glances flicker mad from wine, and to the words they say strange heavy gestures make reply that struggle in the buzzing room. And they say always I and I, and mean they know not whom. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe Read for LibriVox.org by Leon Meyer Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow. Vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore, nameless here for evermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore, but the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door, darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortals ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore! This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping, something louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see, then, what thereat is, and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment in this mystery explore. Tis the wind, and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when, with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door perched upon a bust of pallas just above my chamber door perched and sat and nothing more then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance it wore though thy crest be shorn and shaven now i said art sure no craven ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. 
much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore, for we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such name as Nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on that placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if its soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing further than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, Other friends have flown before, on the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken. Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore, of never, never more. But the raven, still beguiling all my sad soul into smiling, Straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then, upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore, meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing, to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press uh, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, Swung by seraphim, whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, By these angels he hath sent thee, Respite, respite and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, And forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, Prophet still of bird or devil, whether tempter sent, or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted, on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil! Prophet still of bird or devil, By that heaven that bends above us, By that God we both adore, Tell this soul with sorrow laden, If within the distant Aden It shall clasp a sainted maiden Whom the angels name Lenore, Clasp a rare and radiant maiden Whom the angels name Lenore, Quoth the raven, nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked up starting. Get thee back into the tempest in the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul has spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from at my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting, On the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, And the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted nevermore. End of The Raven 
This recording is in the public domain. Sailing to Byzantium by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox by Greg Bathon That is no country for old men. The young in one another's arms. Birds in the trees, those dying generations, at their song. The salmon falls, the mackerel crowded seas, fish, flesh, or fowl, commend all summer long whatever is begotten, born, and dies. Caught in that sensual music, all neglect monuments of unaging intellect. An aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick, unless soul clap its hands and sing, and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. Nor is there singing school but studying monuments of its own magnificence. And therefore I have sailed the seas and come to the holy city of Byzantium. O sages, standing in God's holy fire as in the gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy fire, parent in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away. Sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal, it knows not what it is. And gather me into the artifice of eternity. Once out of nature, I shall never take my bodily form from any natural thing, but such a form as Grecian goldsmiths make of hammered gold and gold enamelling to keep a drowsy emperor awake or set upon a golden bough, to sing to lords and ladies of Byzantium of what is past, or passing, or to come. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Shepherd Boy Sings in the Valley of Humiliation by John Bunyan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T. Wellington. The Shepherd Boy Sings in the Valley of Humiliation. He that is down needs fear no fall. He that is low, no pride. He that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. I am content with what I have, little be it or much. And, Lord, contentment still I crave, because Thou savest such. Fullness to such a burden is that go on pilgrimage. Here little, and hereafter bliss, is best from age to age. End of the poem, The Shepherd Boy Sings in the Valley of Humiliation by John Bunyan. This recording, read by T. Wellington, is in the public domain. Silver by Walter de la Mare Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Slowly, silently, now the moon Walks the night in her silver shoon. This way and that she peers and sees Silver fruit upon silver trees. One by one the casements catch Her beams beneath the silvery thatch. Couched in his kennel like a log With paws of silver sleeps the dog. From their shadowy cot the white breasts peep Of doves in silver feathered sleep. A harvest mouse goes scampering by With silver claws and a silver eye, And moveless fish in the water gleam By silver reeds in a silver stream. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson Read for LibriVox by Greg Bathon It little profits that an idle king, by this still hearth, among these barren crags, matched with an aged wife, I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not thee. I cannot rest from travel. 
I will drink life to the lees. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that loved me and alone, on shore, and when through scudding drifts the rainy Hyades vex the dim sea. I am become a name, for always roaming with the hungry heart much have I seen and known. Cities of men and manners, climates, councils, governments, myself not least, but honoured of them all, and drunk delight of battle with my peers far on the ringing plains of windy Troy. I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untravelled world whose margin fades for ever and for ever when I move. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust, unburnished, not to shine in use, as though to breathe were life, life piled on life were all too little, and of one to me little remains. But every hour is saved from that eternal silence, something more, a bringer of new things, and vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself and this grey spirit yearning in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. This is my son, mine own Telemachus, to whom I leave the sceptre and the isle, well loved of me, discerning to fulfil this labour by slow prudence to make mild a rugged people and through soft degrees subdue them to the useful and the good. Most blameless is he, centred in the sphere of common duties, decent not to fail in offices of tenderness, and pay meet adoration to my household gods when I am gone. He works his work, I mine. There lies the port. The vessel puffs her sail. There gloom the dark, broad seas. My mariners, souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me, that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine and opposed free hearts, free foreheads, you and I are old. Old age hath yet his honour and his toil. Death closes all, but something ere the end, some work of noble note, may yet be done, not unbecoming men that strove with gods. Lights begin to twinkle from the rocks. The long day wanes, the slow moon climbs. The deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. Push off and sitting well in order smite the sounding furrows, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset in the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides, and though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Victory by Rupert Brooke. Read for LibriVox.org by Jandon de Runilla. All night the ways of heaven were desolate, long roads across a gleaming empty sky, outcast and doomed and driven, you and I, alone, serene beyond all love or hate, terror or triumph, were content to wait, we silent and all-knowing. Suddenly swept through the heaven, low crouching from on high, one horseman downward to the earth's low gate. Oh, perfect from the ultimate height of living, lightly we turned through wet woods blossom hung into the open. 
down the supernal roads with plumes a-tossing, purple flags far-flung, rank upon rank, and bridled, unforgiving, thundered the black battalions of the gods. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.